We are live, hallelujah. Tuesday night live, Pastor Bill Emmons, Governor Faith Center, and uh, our, we've uh, readjusted our name, CFC Inter Ministries International. Um, so, but that's only because we've made some changes in the ministry. Uh, good news, and all of you that are ringer followers, oh, I got to get you on my, my monitor here. Hang on before I give out the good news. Okay, there I am. Gotcha. And then I got to put you over on to the church page. So bear with me a moment. And I will do that. Okay. Let's see. Moment of silence. Okay, it says posted. And there it is. Okay, now I go back to monitor. And let's see. Here we are. Oh, what I do? There we go. All right. Hey, Torsha. <laughs> Good to have you with us tonight. Uh, until I get uh, my assistant to be able to handle the equipment uh, and handle monitoring everything, uh, I have to do it. I have to monitor things. Pastor Mary, well, I got volume way too high. Pastor Mary uh, helps me by making sure things are on and running. And so consequently, we're dividing our efforts here, trying to uh, <clears throat> get everything to function properly. Excuse me. I was talking on the phone with some people a little bit longer today than normal. Believe my voice is healed in the name of Jesus. All right, praise the Lord. Again, Pastor Bill Emmons, the Covenant Faith Center, and uh, I'm glad to have you with us tonight. We're on uh, Instagram, we're on Facebook. So, welcome, Facebook family and, and CFC. Uh, let's see, you are our congregation, uh, our church family. Same with you on Instagram. And I, I know uh, Armand is probably watching, even though I can't see his name pop up on the screen. So welcome to have you guys on Instagram. And then we also have Gab, uh, which we're getting a lot of response on Gab. So welcome to everybody on Gab. And um, I'm going to make the effort to get it back on uh, Twitter. And uh, then possibly Sunday, we might be able to go live again on Rumble. Uh, we tried that once and we ran into some problems, but we've made adjustments. So we'll get that going. So here's the totals for the last two services. We have reached 3,908 families or households. So we don't know how many people that actually represents because uh, most households have more than one person. So potentially it could be quite a bit higher than that, but let's just say households, 3,908 households. And if you're watching and your family's there, you ought to have them watch. If you're married, your spouse ought to be watching because this is church. This is our Tuesday night Bible study and you're my congregation. And Sunday morning is our Sunday morning service. And of course, we always encourage you to tune in uh, no matter what uh, time zone you're in. You can't be with us live. Make sure you watch after the fact because the anointing is just as strong after the fact as it is the moment I said it. So make sure you do that. Uh, let's pray. We'll get into our teaching tonight. Father, once again, we come into your presence. We come with thanksgiving. Thank you, Father, for all that, you're, that you have done, all that you are doing, and all that you have planned for us. For your word declares that you know the thoughts and plans you have for us thoughts and plans for good and not evil, thoughts and plans to prosper us and give us a good outcome. So Father, we thank you for that. And Holy Spirit, I thank you for your ministry rising up within me, that anointing to teach the Word of God, that anointing to minister by the gifts of the Spirit. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for manifesting whatever gifts are needed to minister to people tonight. Thank you for giving me utterance and revelation. Thank you for opening the hearts and minds of every person that hears these words to, to see and hear insight or revelation that they've never seen or heard before. Father, it's not that we're looking for anything new. We just want to grow in our depth of understanding of you and of your word and your operations. 
So, Father, we give you the glory for it. I declare people will be healed. People will be saved. People will be baptized in the Holy Ghost. People will be delivered. Prayers will be answered. Needs will be met tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, one more good report. Uh, I had a doctor's appointment today with the heart doctor. He said things are looking really good. Uh, the heart, he says, by all the tests, the heart seems to be getting stronger. Well, I call it brand new, praise God. And uh, he wants me to take another echo, echo, echocardiogram or something like that, where they uh, use that, uh, well, I don't need to get into it. You probably know what it is. <clears throat> anyway, he wants me to take another one to see just how much my heart has improved. Well, because I've been declaring that God is recreating my heart, making it stronger than before, that that's what he's going to see that is getting stronger and stronger to the point that he's finally going to have to come to a place where he says, you know what, you don't need medication. Uh, you don't need uh, any of these other things that we've been doing because it's like you have a brand new heart. And that's what I'm claiming. Hallelujah. All right. So praise the Lord. We're talking about the callings and the giftings of God. And uh, we're in part six of that series. So let's do a brief recap with the foundation scriptures for this subject. First Corinthians chapter 12, verses 27 through 31 from the King James translation. Um, now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues, then he asked the question, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But covet earnestly the best gifts. Hallelujah. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, King James translation, uh, Paul writing to the Ephesian church says that he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. I you notice in the two uh, <clears throat> different references, one of them has more uh, offices or, or anointings, ministry anointings, uh, than the other one. So 1 Corinthians 12, he mentions uh, miracles, gifts of healings, helps governments, diversities of tongues. In, verse, in Ephesians, Chapter 4, he doesn't mention them. He only mentions what we've typically call the five-fold ministry, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teachers. But the reality is the five-fold ministry is supported spiritually by these other ministries. Uh, the, the ministry that I uh, walk in as a pastor and teacher is supported by miracles, by the gifts of healing, by the ministry of helps, by the ministry of governments, by the diversity of tongues. So we have all, all of those nine giftings or anointings are genuine independent ministries, but usually they will work in conjunction with other anointed ministries or other anointings. And some uh, ministers have more than one anointing, for example, with myself, uh, I'm a pastor, I have a pastoral anointing, I'm a teacher, I have a teaching anointing, and I operate in the uh, ministry of healing. And so I have that uh, uh, healings and, and gifts of healings and sometimes even the miracles anointing. And it's as the Spirit wills, it, it uh, you know, comes on uh, each of us uh, at that time the Holy Spirit rises up within us for that area of ministry. Uh, when I'm talking to people as a pastor, that pastoral anointing will manifest. When I'm teaching like I am now, that teaching anointing manifests. When I minister by the Spirit, the, those others, the miracles and the gifts of healings will manifest. And you'll find that typical with most ministers uh, that are anointed by God. <clears throat> they will operate in more than one area of or office of ministry or anointing. Amen. All right, we've already talked about apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So we're moving on now to the other, um, let's see, there'd be four more giftings. 
And uh, so we're going to have that be miracles, gifts of healings, governments, diversity of tongues. Helps government, so there's five of them. Okay, we're going to talk about those during this next uh, grouping of, of anointings. So, uh, I, if I if I get the sound, it gets distorted, it gets too loud or whatever, uh, you can give me a little note. Hey, Liz, uh, cousin, <laughs> good to have you with us tonight. And Steve, good to have you with us. And Torsha, I've already mentioned. Let's see if there's any other names. Only the people who put something on um, Facebook are the ones that I see. The others on Instagram and, and Rumble and on Twitter and on YouTube, I don't see the names. I just see the numbers. But we're glad to have all of you with us tonight. All right. So many times, and I already said this, I'm going to repeat it. Many times the giftings of, of miracles and the gifts of healings anointing uh, will operate with the fivefold ministry. Pastors, apostles, prophets, evangelists, Teachers. <clears throat> now, I want to give you some examples because once you see them in operation in the Bible, it, number one, it becomes easier to believe for them because they're in the Bible. Uh, number two, you see how things operate and how God uses these different anointings to accomplish different things. So, uh, I want to go to 1 Kings chapter 17. We're going to read a few verses here. So, bear with me as we do this. If you have a Bible, uh, it'd be really good if you'd follow along. And we'll be in 1 Kings chapter 17, starting at verse 8. I'll be reading from the King James translation. And whatever translation you've got, just follow along. There'll be some minor differences, uh, but that'll be all right. So we want to look at, starting at verse 8. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise and get thee to Zarephath. Now, before I go any further, we probably already recognize who this is about. This is about Elijah, okay? So this is a, a, a not just a story. This is an experience that was put in the Bible for our benefit. So arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belong, belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So what we have first, before we get into the offices of ministry, we have the uh, prophetic in operation, it would be really a word of uh, knowledge and a word of wisdom. The word of knowledge is knowing what God um, is doing, and the word of wisdom is what to do with that knowledge. And so we have the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and the prophetic is already in operation. And we haven't even gotten to the office of ministry of Elijah. Of course, we all consider him to be a prophet, but let's keep reading. All right, so verse 10 so he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate, my pages are sticking together here, come on. When he came to the gate of the uh, city, behold, the widow woman was there, um, was there gathering sticks, and he called to her and said, fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, uh, bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. So now he was not uh, unknown uh, in these areas in that day and time. Uh, the name Elijah uh, rang bells. Uh, for some people, it was fear because uh, they knew he was a prophet of God and, and God would show him things that um, uh, would get countries straightened out, uh, kings straightened out, and get individuals straightened out, get, get other prophets straightened out. So he has that prophetic anointing. Um, but he speaks here and, and speaks to her. Uh, he's operating based on what the Spirit of God already spoke to him, that I've commanded a widow woman to feed you. She didn't quite yet understand that, and you can tell by her response. She says uh, in verse 11, as she was going, or verse 12, and she said, as the Lord and thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in, in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and for my son, that we may eat it and die. So she wasn't operating a lot of great faith at this point. Uh, she already knew in her heart that God was speaking to her about taking care of this prophet, but she was more centered or focused on her condition instead of on the will of God. 
but she did obey. She obeyed the voice of the prophet. And so we go on in uh, verse 13, Elijah said unto her, fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first and bring it unto me and after make for thee and for thy son. <clears throat> now, when you read stories like this, it's easy to get an attitude against the prophet. Um, you know, well, who does he think he is? He say, feed me first, and then whatever's left over, you can, you know, take for you and your son. No, it's, it's giving her an opportunity to act in faith. He's laying out choices before her. God always lays out choices. You remember the scripture that says, God is speaking, and he said, I've set before you this day life and death, blessing and cursing. So he's given us choices of life or death. He's given us choices of blessing or cursing, and we have to choose. And, and you know, sometimes people don't quite get it, and so uh, they, they have to be told which is the right choice. So in that same verse, God says, and I almost kind of want to insert a word there, by the way, <laughs> And he says, choose life, choose life. Why? Because life is better than death and blessing is better than cursing. Amen? Amen. So we're down to verse, um, uh, let's see, verse 14. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste. There is the prophetic, and that's also a word of knowledge. The bar barrel of meal shall not waste, Neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. So you've got a word of knowledge here. Now these are the gifts of the Spirit. We're not, this is, so far we're not really talking about the offices or anointings uh, of ministry. We're talking about the gifts of the Spirit in operation, even in the Old Testament. And so verse 15, and she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. So she went from having enough to eat one meal and die to having enough to go on for, it doesn't say how many days, it just says for many days. And she went from feeding her and her son to feeding her and her son and the prophet. So her ability was increased by at least a third by her obedience. But then you multiply the number of days, she went from one meal to a number of days. And it does, again, it doesn't say how many days. And uh, so we see that, that not only was the gifting of the prophet in operation, the gift of prophecy was in operation, the word of wisdom was in operation, the word of knowledge was in operation, but we see that the woman, by simply obeying the prophet, went from fear to faith, went from failure to blessing. And that's what God said when he said, I've set before you this day, life and death, blessing and cursing. She had to make a choice. Today, it doesn't matter what anointing the preacher has on him. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, helps governments, miracles, gifts of healings, uh, whatever office it may be. You as a believer have to make a choice to receive. That's why I tell people, don't just tune in, you know, the, the average viewing time on videos. I'm talking about this is, you know, worldwide. This is not with us. I'm just saying this is what they say is generally the case. The average viewing time on social media is six minutes. Because we live in such an instant um, satisfaction society, we want everything now. You can go online and find out the weather, find out the stock market, find out, you know, all these things that are going on around you. Uh, I watch uh, Silver and Gold. Uh, I don't really pay a lot of attention to the stock market. I watch uh, three, uh, uh, well, what do you call them? Three different stocks, not individual stocks, but um, S&P 500 and so forth. Uh, and I watch the price of oil, and, I, and now it's like $68 a barrel. Uh, when President Trump was in office, it was just going under $40 a barrel. And we went from gas that was, uh, back here, it was under a dollar. No, everything was a dollar in Oklahoma last time we were back here when President Trump was in power. I remember it was like a dollar twenty-three, if I remember right. And now it's two eighty-five here in, in the Tulsa area. 
uh, in California, it was up over $4 a gallon after he went out of office, it began to climb and now it's up uh, over $4 a gallon again. So before President Trump got in office, it was going up that way. And now with Biden in, in uh, occupying the White House, uh, if in fact he is, <laughs> Uh, it's gone up again. So we, we see that when you, when you trust in God, you put your faith in him, he has a way of, of taking care of you. He has a way of multiplying uh, your provision, uh, your supply. And uh, we have to remember that God is our source. He said in Psalm 91 that uh, not only would he take care of us and provide for us, that he would be with us in trouble. When there, when there was trouble, he would be with us. He would not fail us. He would not forsake us. Uh, I, I have lived in California all my life up until the middle of July of this year. And right now we're in Tulsa. And as I've said many times, we don't know how long that'll be or what the next step may be, but we're doing what we know to do right now. Uh, but I have never had a tornado warning up until I got here. And here we are uh, in Tulsa. We've had two tornado warnings. Uh, one went north of us, one went uh, east of us. But we, we took authority over that. And see, what we have to do is trust what God said is true. So the Bible says, whatever you bind is bound. Whatever you loose is loose. You have to come to a place where you decide to believe that. You decide to accept the word of God as absolute truth. And when you do that, you start getting results. Uh, in California, we were having a major earthquake on average every 20 years in the LA, Southern California area. And uh, of course, in my lifetime, I've been through a few. And uh, finally, when I got a hold of this uh, understanding of what God has declared to be life, to be blessing, uh, and the authority to bind and to loose and to, on purpose, live in the blessing, it changed my attitude. I began to get bold about binding and loosing. And I learned some things about earthquakes, and I found out there was something called the slow slip. And that the slow slip is when the, the um, uh, continental plates are moving very slowly, so slowly they can't even register earthquakes from it. Uh, and the uh, the, the other things that slip, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, cause earthquakes, the same thing. So when I learned that, I, I began to go from binding earthquakes and loosing peace upon the land to allowing, and I speak to the land, just like Jesus spoke to the wind, he spoke to the waves, he spoke to the fish, he spoke to the fig tree. He was speaking to things and the Bible says to copy his example. And so I was, I still speak to the land. And I command, I loose peace upon the land. I bind up earthquakes in the name of Jesus. And you know, it's been since, since 19, was it 94, I believe was the last major earthquake in Southern California. Uh, right, 94? Yeah. So we got 2004, 2014, and we're quickly approaching 224, you know, 2024. So uh, 28 years have gone by and Southern California, where we lived up until July, has not experienced any major earthquakes. You say, well, you know, that's just a coincidence. Well, historically, every 20 years, there was one. So what changed? What changed is not only us, but a bunch of people, including our congregation, got a hold of the scriptures that, and the understanding, the insight, what you bind is bound, what you loose is loose. So we began binding earthquakes. When the COVID, um, you gotta be careful what I say here. When COVID became what everybody tried to make it uh, back in March a year ago, you know, now we're, we're a year and a half, year, you know, 18 months uh, since then, um, we went around our church building and we took anointing oil and we told people, you know, uh, we're doing this. And we anointed the, the lintel above, the threshold beneath, and the two side posts, just like they did in Egypt uh, at the Passover. And, uh, you know, if you ever notice, uh, oil is liquid, it drips. 
you put it up on the top and it drips down to the bottom and, it, and then the side to side forms a uh, symbol of the cross. I think that's quite interesting. Anyway, we did that on our entries and our exits and we went around the property and we anointed things and, and we spoke to the spirit of, of the COVID. Um, and, and again, I hesitate to say <laughs> any more than that. We spoke to that spirit. We bound it up from coming into our congregation, into our uh, facility. We declared that nobody coming to our services would get COVID from coming to our services. And not one person did, even including us. And we were there every service. And um, of course, we did that over us. We bound it up over our lives. And, and um, we've never gotten it. And we're not going to get it. And we're not going to get the variant or whatever that is. Uh, it's under the curse. And Galatians 3.13 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse. You have to make up your mind you believe these things and then take a stand and begin to declare them over yourselves. Well, here, this woman finally obeyed the prophet and it produced immediate results. And uh, let's go on uh, in verse 16. It says, The barrel did not uh, waste, uh, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. It came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick, and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. Hallelujah. I'm just checking my monitors here. There was no breath left in him. And, he, and uh, she said to, unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into the loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? Now you remember, Elijah was not born again. He didn't have the Bible. He didn't, he didn't have the, the indwelling Holy Spirit. He did not have somebody to teach him the truth of God's word with revelation. He didn't have a New Testament. So he's uh, operating the best he can. Of course, we know that the beginning of the story, he was fleeing from uh, a potential threat to his life. And, uh, you know, <laughs> so he had his ups and downs too. But God used him anyway because he was obedient. When God spoke, he acted. And that's the same way with this woman. She spoke. I mean, um, God had already spoken to the prophet. He spoke. She finally acted and she got results. So now when we get down here to uh, verse 21, he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. There's some wisdom. There's some insight into those words. Uh, and we need to take some time. I'm not going to do it right now, but individually you need to take some time and study and meditate upon his prayer right there. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the soul of the child came into him again and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down uh, out of the chamber into the house and delivered him un unto his mother. And Elijah said, see, thy son liveth. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord uh, in my mouth is true. She finally got it. She went through a lot. That's a lot to go through, thinking you're going to die of starvation. And then when that uh, God meets that need, then all of a sudden your son gets sick and he, and, and he dies. And, uh, you know, most people think, well, when they... When the heartbeat stops and the breath stops, uh, that they're dead and, they're, and there's no hope. Well, I'm here to tell you by now personal experience that on August 8th, my heart stopped. My breathing stopped. And the paramedics said I was dead. And uh, yet my son kept uh, doing CPR on me. And uh, when the paramedics got here with their equipment, they took over and, and I was revived and taken to the hospital and they did their thing. And of course, Mary was praying the whole time. Jonathan was praying. And um, 
as they prayed and interceded, and they were, I'm sure Mary was binding and loosing and speaking the name of Jesus, doing the things we've been taught to do. And like it said, he revived. His spirit came into him again. And that's what happened to me. I, I was in heaven. I got a glimpse of heaven. I wasn't there very long. I didn't see a lot. But what I saw was overwhelming. And, and uh, the few days after the hospital experience, I couldn't hardly talk about it without um, welling up with tears and thanksgiving to God, you know, just such a, a, a tremendous experience. But uh, I was revived. And, you know, the doctor, uh, some of the nurses, the paramedics, they said, you know, that that particular kind of cardiac arrest is uh, what they call the widowmaker. It's, it's uh, only 1% of people that experience it survive it. And uh, so that put me in the one percentile. Uh, you know, the, the world thinks the one percenters are the wealthy rich. Uh, the one percenters are the ones that survive the attacks of the devil. But we need to improve that percentage. Amen. All right. So now let's look at another man. Um, Second Kings chapter six. We're going to just do seven verses there. But verse one. The sons of the prophets said unto Elisha. Now this, Elisha was Elijah's understudy. And um, uh, he, when, when Elijah left, uh, he was going, he, he knew he was going to be leaving and going to heaven. And he was raptured or caught up. That's what the word rapture means. But before that, on his preparation for that, uh, Elisha, said, I, I want to be there when it happens. Because Elijah said, you stay on this side of the river, I'm going to go on the other side, and the chariot of God's going to come get me. And, you know, so Elisha said, no, Lord, Master. He says, uh, I, I, want to, I want to be there when it happens. And, or Elijah, yeah, Elisha said that. And so he let him go over with him and be there when that experience took place. And Elijah said to Elisha, what, what can I do for you? What do you want? And he said that I might have a double dose of your anointing. And um, Elijah, uh, his response was basically, if, if you'll be there when this happens, when I'm taken up, then you can have that. So Elijah made sure that he was there. He did not leave Elijah alone for a minute. And when that chariot came down and took Elijah up, uh, you know, the mantle of Elijah fell on Elisha, which represents that anointing. But he got a double dose. And he did, if you go back and do a study, he did twice as many miracles as Elijah did. So we have to assume then that his request of a double uh, anointing or a double um, blessing uh, happened. So here we get a prophet understudy speaking to a prophet. And those obviously are offices of ministry and uh, getting supernatural results. Uh, themselves and Elisha stepped into the office of prophet after Elijah left, and and then he did mighty works. Let's continue on here. Um, the sons of the pro uh, prophets said unto Elisha, "Behold, now the place where we dwell with thee is too straight, or it's, it's too small. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan and take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell." And he answered, go ye. In other words, that's what you want to do. Do it. By the way, uh, I, I want you to stop and think for a minute. Here were students of prophets that were studying. It was a school of prophets. So they were, uh, and, and these, this particular group was, were the sons of prophets at that. Just because they were sons of prophets, just because they may have gone to the school of prophets, does not make them a prophet. When we first started this study, I really spent time talking about the calling of God on people's lives, that you don't just decide you're going to be a prophet or an apostle or evangelist or a pastor or a teacher. You don't decide these things. It's a call of God. And if God hasn't called you and you don't know whether or not you're called, then you probably shouldn't step out and try and be that. You need to wait until you know it's confirmed in your heart um, and I hate to use words, a prophetic word, as um, an, a, a, a um, directive to my life. 
But a prophetic word can be a real strong confirmation, and that's what prophecy really should be. It should be a confirmation of things that God has already dealt with you on. And in your heart, you already had that leaning, and the prophet speaks and confirms that. So uh, <laughs> they're griping and complaining now because they've outgrown their facility. Let's put it that way. And so he told them to go do it. So, and one said, um, and one said, be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them. And when they came to Jordan, they cut down the wood. But as one was falling or felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water and he cried and said, alas, alas, master, for it was borrowed. So now he's going to be responsible to, to replace that axe head. And the man of God said, where fell it? And he showed him and, and uh, he cut down a stick and cast it thither <laughs> and the iron did swim. I would love to have seen that. And when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask for a replay. Uh, I want to see that ax head swim. Uh, that's just an amazing thing. Now that's a working of miracles. A working of miracles, and I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but a working of miracles actually involves the person doing something. And so um, with e Elijah and the widow woman, it was her being obedient to take the little bit of oil she had and a little bit of flour and make bread and serve the prophet first. That released the miracle into her life. Um, the second miracle she had with her son being raised up was first giving her son to the prophet to have him take her, take him up in the loft and pray over him and minister to him. And he was raised up from the dead. She got a miracle. You know, her son was back. Uh, in this instance here, and these are not just parables or stories. These are real events that took place and they were recorded for us. All right, I'm just making sure everything's still recording. Hey, Chris, good to have you with us tonight. Another cousin, <laughs> hallelujah. All right, um, so the axe had swam. And uh, I, when I said, I wanna get a replay of that. You know, I love to watch football. And um, so, you know, the instant replays, you know, where they show you what actually took place. Now they've got cameras everywhere. They can go in different places in the computer. Um, it, it kind of stitches together the different play, the different views of the camera to put together something, a 360 degree view. You can move any direction and see the detail of what went on in that play. And uh, I, I love watching that stuff, you know. But um, when I get to heaven, I, I'm probably going to spend some time watching replays of miracles of God in the Old Testament and into the New Testament because there was so many things that took place that we read as parables, we read them as stories, when in reality, this was life, this was real. And it, the things we see, see God's no respect to a persons. So the things we see God do in the Old Testament through the prophets and through just people that would believe God, God will do for you if you believe God. You don't have to be a prophet. You just gotta make a choice to believe God and believe his word and then act like it's true. That's why James says, be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. That's why uh, Joshua 1, the, our script, our um, ministry foundation scripture is this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, that you may observe and do all that's written there and that you may observe and do. So you got to be a doer. It's not enough to learn it, not enough to hear it, not enough to get inspired. You've got to make a decision to believe. You got to make a decision to do. You say, well, I'm having a real hard time believing. Then you need to go back to what Joshua 1.8 says, meditate the word of God day and night. Find the scriptures that are the answer, the solution, the miracle that you need, and spend the time meditating on those scriptures until it goes off inside of you. And all of a sudden you get the revelation and, and you know that you know that you know that it's real for you. And then you need to act on it and you need to declare it because our words are part of our miracle. And so you need to declare what God promised you as a fact in your life. By his stripes, I was healed. Well, my confession is by his stripes, I am healed. The Bible says my youth or our youth is renewed as the eagle. So I lay claim to that, but on a daily basis. So I say my youth renewed daily. Every cell, every tissue, every organ in my body is renewed daily in the name of Jesus. 
and um, I'm watching some things in my body that are, to me, clear evidences that that's going on. I don't need to get into that right now. Down the road, I might share some of these things with you. My heart is one of them, though. I'll tell you that because I've been dealing with that outward. I've been letting people know. All right, so <clears throat> the working of miracles involves doing something. It's not, not just a miracle that happened spontaneously, but and the working of miracles, the word working there literally um, tells us that there is some kind of action that's taking place that leads up to the miracle. In this case, they, they did something really simple. Cut down a stick and threw it in the water where the axe head fell in. That doesn't seem like a very miraculous thing, but it was an act of obedience to the leading of the Spirit, and I don't think a stick is going to make an axe head swim all by itself. Maybe you want to try that sometime and let me know. Throw an axe head into a stream or pond or, you know, something and throw a stick in after it and see if it swims. <laughs> you understand? This was a miracle. This was not a natural thing. This was above the, the natural. And, uh, but by that simple act of obedience, the prophet Elisha had to obey the leading of the spirit. And then the man who, uh, lost the accident, had to obey whatever the prophet said for him to do. And the miracle took place, the axe head swam. And it's, therefore he said, take it up uh, to thee. And he put out his hand and took it. You know, there's a lot of people that would, would even hesitate to put out their hand if that axe head swam up to him. I ain't touching that axe head. That thing's demon possessed. I mean, <laughs> I don't know how it's going to do that. How, how can an axe head swim? No, no, I'm getting away from this. We need to understand we're dealing with things of God. The devil cannot get in there and, and deceive us that way. When we're believing God, the devil has no place in that. When you're praying in tongues, the devil has no place in that. When you're meditating the word of God, the devil has no place there. When you're praying, now he might try and play with your thoughts or your emotions, but that, that does, has no power to change anything when you've made a decision to believe God, act on the word, speak the word, and you'll get results. Amen. All right. Let's take one more example of this. Uh, the Apostle Paul, bring it into the New Testament. In Acts chapter 19, verse 11 and 12, in King James translation, it says, And God wrought special miracle by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and evil spirits went out of them. Now I can speak from personal experience on this because we've done the same thing. We've, we've gotten testimony back of people being healed by taking a, we, we got um, a bunch of handkerchiefs, uh, brand new ones, cotton. <laughs> and we pray as a congregation, we prayed over them, laid hands on them. Uh, while I was preaching one Sunday morning, I had them on the pulpit there as I was preaching where the anointing was flowing. And then we uh, put them in little packs uh, with scripture references and, and uh, some uh, instructions. And people would take those and they'd pull that out and lay it on somebody sick or on their own body and healing would come. Over the years, we've seen many different manifestations of the gifts of healings and the working of miracles in people's lives. Uh, and again, we've seen it personally ourselves. Uh, there's so many things God has made available to us. And as I'm talking about it, my mind is thinking about some of the other experiences that I've had that were supernatural. And, and I just can't get into them right now, trying to stay on the subject here. All right. So God brought special miracles by the hands of Paul. Handkerchiefs, towels, or aprons, touched his skin, laid upon other people. And they got healed. They got delivered. <clears throat> there was a uh, in the Bible, an example of somebody that uh, they were waiting for Paul's shadow to fall on them and they got healed. Uh, another person waiting for the uh, waters in a, uh, um, uh, I call it a pond, but it was a, uh, Mary, what would you call that? Uh, waiting for the stirring of the waters. It wasn't a well, it was a, a, pool. a pool. Yeah, so a pond, a pool. Uh, and this guy was crippled and uh, you know, he tried to get up because there was an angel there doing that. And the first person that would jump in would get healed. And he was too slow and couldn't get there. 
Uh, but eventually he got his healing. And that came by a simple word, a command. Uh, one by the shadow falling across the woman with the issue of blood, touching the hem of Jesus' garment. And it wasn't Jesus doing that. It was her belief, her faith. She chose to believe, excuse me, she chose to believe some testimony of somebody who touched Jesus and got healed. We don't know who that was, but she heard that or saw it somewhere. And that it inspired her to believe for her own miracle. And she kept saying, the Bible says, if I but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. And of course, when she did, Jesus immediately knew that healing anointing flowed from him. And you know, he was being thronged. There was people all around touching him and the disciples, what do you mean somebody touched you? Everybody's trying to touch you. But one person reached out with her faith and touched him. I want to be that one person that reaches out with my faith and gets results. I don't want to be just the people running to every meeting that comes along and say, hallelujah, praise the Lord. You know, I believe in miracles and never get a miracle, never get a healing. I want to be the one that takes it. And I, I'm, I've been doing that for a long time now. Praise God. All right. Now, uh, a miracle usually involves a creative or recreative process. Uh, part, part of, uh, you know, when you talk about creative, it, it's, it's um, literally something is creative. Okay. When Jesus took mud and put it in the guy's eye socket, and then he could see there was a creative miracle. That mud somehow, some way turned into eyeballs and all the nerves were connected somehow. And I don't, I can't physiologically explain how all I know it was a miracle and miracle is beyond the natural, beyond the normal way of doing things. But he could see, he got eyes. Hallelujah. What about the, uh, the lepers that came and asked for prayer and um, the, the, the Bible says that, that they went and did what the prophet said and they all got healed, but one came back to give thanksgiving and the Bible says he was made whole. Now, it's good to be thankful. I, since uh, I had that experience back in August and uh, praise God, I'm here to t tell about it. Um, I give thanks every day. I, I, I wake up in the morning giving thanks. I go to bed at night giving thanks. And many times throughout the day, I'll just stop and say, thank you, Lord, I appreciate this. I appreciate another day. I appreciate time with Mary and more time and, and time to minister to people and time to be a witness. And everywhere I go, I'm talking to people about what, what God did for me and how God raised me up. Um, it doesn't, if I'm in a place where there's people I'm talking to them, it's, it's not taking me very long to bring this subject around to uh, God raising me from the dead. Uh, I want people to know that God's still alive and well, and he's still doing miracles today. Amen? Amen. So the, the working of miracles or the ministry of miracles will involve many times a working of miracles where they're actually doing something uh, like the handkerchiefs or aprons put on people um, or the mud turning into eyes you know, and other things we could think about going through the Bible. Uh, or a recreative miracle where the leper, his, his flesh was recreated and came back on his bones. Uh, that's a miracle. I don't care what you want to call it, but that was the working of miracles and the gifts of healing. So the gifts of healing was the healing from leprosy. That just means that the disease stopped. But the working of miracles or the miracle part of it was the restoration of the flesh that had been eaten away because that's what leprosy does. It eats the flesh away. So there were two things that took place. And many times they work in conjunction, the healing of, of the lepers and the one who got restored and made whole. So as we study and we'll get into the gifts of the spirit, and I know all of you out there, I'm sure you've heard a lot of teaching on the gifts of the spirit, but you know, we're, we meditate the word day and night we're going to hit some of the same scriptures over and over and over again. And, and the Bible tells us to study the word of God and meditate the word of God. So just because you heard it once doesn't mean you got it all. 
Uh, I, this afternoon, you've heard this kind of a illustration before, but this afternoon, Mary had taken out a couple steaks and got my new pellet grill out there that I, I absolutely love it, man. I'll tell you what, everything I've put, cooked on that thing so far is tasting the best I've ever tasted. That could be my taste buds after everything that took place, but I don't know. It, it was great. I cooked a couple steaks and, and boy, they were good. But Mary could have said to me, you want to have steaks tomorrow, you know, yesterday. And she did say that. And um, I could have said, no, I've had steaks before. And she might have said something like, well, don't you like them anymore? And I, I could have said, oh, yeah, I enjoyed it. It was really good. I remember how it tasted and how it smelled. And But that's past tense. I'm not getting any benefit from it today unless I eat another steak or, you know, anything else that I like that we're talking about. Same thing is true with the Word of God. <laughs> Believe it or not, we had a situation where somebody sat in the church in our service and was texting to other people in the church when I would bring up things that I've talked about before. And uh, that, that's old news, that's, that's old stuff. Um, like, well, I don't need to listen now for the next half hour because I've heard that before. You ever get around somebody and say, well, I've heard that faith stuff before. I've heard that healing stuff. I've heard that miracle stuff. I've heard that confession stuff. You know, the thing is, just because we heard it once doesn't mean we got it. You got to take time to study and meditate on those verses that reveal those things until you do get it, until it goes off inside of you. Then you've got to keep it alive. Once you got the revelation, you know, you can fade away. That, that can, Your memory can fade away. And your experience can fade away, but you keep it alive by continuing to go back to the scripture that produced it and, and declare that over your life on a daily basis. I started declaring that, that I'm healed and, and uh, I can do things, all things through Christ will strengthen me. Nothing's impossible to me because I am a believer. And so Mary and I started walking. I said, well, I don't need a walker. If I'm a healed man, I don't need a walker. And we put the walker away. And then, uh, you know, I, I finally, she asked me, you know, how I felt about driving. I said, you know what? Healed men can drive a car. I, I can drive and I can drive just fine. And I started driving again and I've had no problems with it. And, uh, you know, things like that where you, you have to just take it by faith. You have to make up your mind. You're going to apply your faith. You're going to build your faith first and then you're going to apply it to the situation to come along so that you can get the results the Bible says you can have. The God, you know, as far as God's concerned, the promises of God are yea and amen. That's yes, and so be it. But you've got to make it that way in your thinking and in your heart. You've got to decide the promises of God are yes for me and so be it for me as well. They are my promises. I'm redeemed from the curse. I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. I had already, before I ever left the hospital, I had already told the doctor that we met with today, that uh, I'm going to be getting a treadmill and I'm going to start working out on that treadmill. And I'm gonna, I'm, I, I didn't say a whole lot about, you know, God. I did tell him I believe God's healing my heart and that I'm going to have a new heart and uh, I'm going to exercise and build back what the devil tried to destroy. And, uh, and so I was ready back then. That was day eight after the event. Uh, it took me a while to get the treadmill. We finally got it up here last week and set up and I started using it. And I told the doctor today and I said, you know, I just started with a, a half mile. He said, oh, that's really great. Yeah, keep it up. And, you know, he says, you know what? Basically, you can do anything you want now. He said, you, you're in pretty good shape. Whatever you want to do, just don't overdo it. And if you start feeling a little tired, quit. Take a rest. Take a breather. And, uh, you know, he said, basically, go back to life as normal. Mary, didn't that basically what he said today? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I said, is there anything I cannot do? He said, well, there's some things like we talked about exercise. He said, well, you might want to hold off on push-ups for a couple months and, and bench presses for a couple months. Give everything in your, all the bone and cartilage a chance to totally recover. Said, but other than that, I said, can I play baseball? He says, yeah, if you feel like you can, do it, you know. Uh, I, I like to play baseball. <laughs> anyway, so creative miracles and recreative miracles. There are both. By the way, you may not have thought about this. 
the creation in Genesis was a recreative series of miracles because the earth already was in existence before the uh, Genesis chapter 1. It already existed. All we see is the t what happened after, you know, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the world. Um, the beginning, uh, God created the heavens and the earth. I'm sorry. I'm thinking about two different scriptures. God created the heavens and the earth. That verse read in the original language gives you a, an understanding of a perfectly ordered creation. But in verse two, when you read the original language, it gives you a clear picture of a state of chaos. What happened between verse one and verse two? Well, theologians call this the gap theory and they call it a theory, but I don't think it's a theory. I think it has to be true because we know there was all kinds of stuff that went on before man came around. And, you know, then man, man was created and told to replenish the earth. You can't replenish something that wasn't plenished before. Amen? So we have a recreative miracle that took place, and man became a part of that miracle, where God told Adam to go out and replenish the earth, subdue the earth, have dominion over it. And then Psalm 8 tells us again how vast, reach, how far-reaching that miracle that God put in man's hands was. He said, what is man that you're so mindful of him that you'd put everything under his feet, all. And he talks about the sun, the moon, the stars, the animals, just like he did in Genesis. It's all under man's feet. But it had to be, there had to be a recreative process take place first. So even God operated in the same things we're talking about that are available to us. God operated in the original creation, which was a miracle, and then in the recreation, which was a recreative miracle. And we see things like that happening throughout the Bible. And I'm running out of time. <laughs> Praise God. You know, I get excited about these things. And um, I, I tell stories. And, and you know, again, that same person that was texting people about, oh, that's old stuff. You know, old story, OS, you know, old story. Well, you know, we need to hear some things a lot of time before we finally get it. Some people are a little bit slower than others to catch on. Some people are a little bit slower or hesitant to make the decision to walk by faith. When I got a hold of these things, man, I didn't hesitate. I grew up in church and I, I know religion. But when I heard these teachings, I jumped on. I said, this is what I've been looking for. Uh, we've tried other things that didn't have any substance to them. But this had the word. That was the substance. And so we jumped on the word of faith. We jumped on healing. We jumped on God's provision, uh, answered prayer. And they've been working for us now for what, 49 years, I guess now, close to 50 years. Hallelujah. All right. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, next Tuesday night, I'm going to talk about uh, the ministry or the anointing of gifts of healings, which I've kind of referenced a little bit tonight. So we'll start with that next Tuesday night. And uh, then we will move on. And I'm looking at my next page here. Uh, we're going to see Elisha again uh, in the gifts of healings operation and Jesus operating it. Then we're going to move into the helps governments and diversity of tongues, what they are, how they operate. If we can wrap that all up next week, it depends on how many stories come up by the Spirit of God in me and how many testimonies come. But if I wrap that up next week, then we'll move into the gifts of the Spirit as the next step, uh, wanting to understand how God moves in the earth, how he ministers through both the anointed anointings, callings of God, and the giftings of God. That's what this series is about. So with that, I want to say thank you for viewing tonight and being with us or viewing this later, whenever that is. If you're not one of our partners, I encourage you, I'm getting ready to write a partner letter here uh, for the holidays. I, I might, I'm not promising partners, I might get it out this week. But we also want to send you a gift. We appreciate our partners. We've started sending them gifts and just something to say thank you so much. We think what we send you is going to bless you and you have been a blessing to us. And you guys, our partners, is what makes this broadcast available and allows us to expand and go on multiple outlets here in social media. I just got a letter about a week ago from a TV network that's asked us to put our program uh, on their network and, uh, and the price, you know, it's 50 bucks a week, you know, for a 30 minute program, 
you can't hardly beat that, and it's worldwide. Uh, when God provides the finances to do that, I'm, I'm ready to do it, praise God. We've got the equipment now to do things correctly, professionally, and uh, if, if uh, well, I'm not going to say if, when God provides financial ability to take that step, we're going to do that. But it's fun when people start contacting us and say, would you do this? Would you be part of our worldwide ministry team? All right. If you want to support this ministry, if you're blessed by this ministry, uh, let me tell you quickly how you can do that. If you have a PayPal account, you can type in a search for uh, W-E-M-M-O-N-S. O or zero one, not O one, zero one, W M is zero one at gmail.com. That'll take you to our PayPal page. You put in the amount. The next page you choose friends and family option, and uh, that will go into our ministry account when it's transferred. If you got a Venmo account, you go to Venmo and type in the at symbol at William dash Emmons dash 10. Make sure to capitalize the first letter of both my names, William and Emmons. Uh, if you yeah. want, Jasmine's watching. I'm gonna have to turn off. But you want to say hi to Jasmine? Oh, hi, Jasmine. Praise God. Which Jasmine? Our Jasmine. Uh, which which of our Jasmines? William Jasmine. Yeah. Hi, Jasmine. Good to have you with us. And Will, if you're there, we love you guys. If you want to get my debit or credit card, you can send us an email with the information or text it to eight one eight six seven nine seven zero six seven. If you want to give by check or money order, send it to Post Office Box fourteen ten seventy four Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. Zip code 74014. And I'm out of time. We love you guys. See you Sunday morning. California time, 10 o'clock. Midwest time, uh, noon. And after that, you figure it out. <laughs> we love you guys. Bye-bye.